Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Pulitzer Prize winning cultural critic and writer Margot Jefferson. She's been a staff writer for the New York Times and Newsweek. Her reviews and essays have appeared in New York Magazine, Grand Street, Vogue, Harper's, among others. Jefferson's first monograph on Michael Jackson was published in 2006. She has received a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Rockefeller Foundation Theater Communications Group grant. Her 2015 book, The Memoir Negro Land, received the National Book Circle Critics Circle Award for Autobiography, the Heartland Prize for Nonfiction, the Bridge Prize for Nonfiction, and was shortlisted for the Bailey Gifford Prize. Jefferson currently teaches writing at Columbia University School of the Arts. She gave lectures titled From I to We, The Role of the Citizen Critic, at the University of Oregon in Eugene and in Portland on May 30th and 31st, 2018, as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2017-18 Criticos Lecture in the Humanities. The lectures were part of the We the People series. Thank you, Margot, for coming on the show. I'm glad to be here. I just learned that your, that your first book on Michael Jackson has recently been re-released by the very esteemed British uh, press, Granta Books. The book was first published in 2006. Why were you inspired to write the book about Jackson at that moment when you first wrote it? And what were you hoping for for that book? What were you trying to accomplish with that you book? You know, I had a conversation with my editor before I started writing, and it, we were really just talking about Michael Jackson. And this would have been maybe around 2002, three. so everything was charged and difficult and controversial and um, un unsettlingly mysterious, mm -hmm. um, you know, on the surface and inside. And we had both loved him for many years, and really thought he was a great, great entertainer and performer. Um, and my editor said, boy, and I had written a piece about him for Vogue magazine a few years before where I had compared his physical transformations, mm -hmm. now that was a few years before, to Cindy Sherman mm. and what she was mm. doing. Interesting. And my editor said, I'd love to see him get his due before he self-destructs. And I said, me too, let me write, let me write. Now, I wasn't quick enough mm. by the time, you know, the, the book came out. And actually, the hardback came out in 2005. He had just been, quote, exonerated, close quote, but really, mm -hmm. you know, he was, he was disgraced. Mm -hmm. you know, everything had, had pretty much fallen apart. Uh, I'm, st you know, I'm still, I was still glad that I had written the book because he was, all stages of the life and career were so interesting, um, you know, as, as cultural signs and, and Im emblems and representations and symbols and, you know, every single thing that he, that he did, you know, from the, from the skin lightening to the facial transformations, you know, to the, the body shrinking, a mm -hmm. kind of anorexia, mm -hmm. you know, to the, all of these, to even the, um, the musical changes. Oh, is this black music? Was it white music? Is it, oh, you know, look at the homages to old Hollywood. No, oop, he took the moonwalk, you know, from that little street dancer. All of these conundrums and conflicts and collaborations were central to big American cultural issues. So it was as if he was carrying mm -hmm. all of these huge matters in his um, body and psyche. And that was endlessly interesting to me. So now that Grant has republished the book, and it's now 2018, mm -hmm. how do you think about it now? Well, I, you know, I, I, of course, well, I shouldn't say of course, it doesn't always happen, but I did want to write um, a new introduction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting because he, on one hand, he's in a kind of pantheon. You know, he's, he's been reclaimed mm -hmm. you know, as a major artist by rock pop. He's totally in the um, deconstruction, <laughs> you know, cultural criticism, you name it, cultural studies, wing of the academy. He's absolutely, you know, a major figure there. Um, and that, I'm pleased about that. Uh, I really am. I feel he's vindicated in some way. It's also unsettling 
to think in terms of particularly Me Too and Time's Up mm -hmm. of those not ever fully answered, except again by char open charges. He was recently charged again, you know, in the court of public opinion by a young man, the young man who was in the movie with him, mm -hmm. said, no, he did sexually abuse me. Mm -hmm. There are also various, un you know, kind of underground um, anecdotal rumors. One doesn't know, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it bothers me still that I feel I didn't fully grapple with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure how I would have, mm -hmm. but I feel now, ah, I, want, I wanted to just air more thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. So w one of the things I, I, I'm always interested in in your writing is this question of genre or form. And I, I know that the book is sometimes categorized as a biography. But of course, when I read it, it doesn't seem to be a biography. How would you? So what would you right. describe? What, what would you uh, describe? I call it for, as uh, I call it um, an essay in cultural criticism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. an essay literally as a noun and as a verb, you know, mm. meaning the test, the trial, the mm -hmm. the journey. Uh, that's that's yeah. lovely. That's lovely. Um, so at the moment, we're witnessing this incredible outpouring of creativity from African Americans in every field, writing, writers, dancers, filmmakers, dramatists, musicians, artists, rappers, comedians, it just goes on and on. Um, are you tempted to write a book about one of today's incredible African Americans? At the moment, I am, at the moment, I am not. I am very happy to be a spectator, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> and you know, one day I'm a fan, the next day, you know, I go into my hmm, you know, uh, critical mode. Uh, it, and I think it's really because rather than doing that again after Michael Jackson, I moved in another direction. I moved into a kind of um, memoiristic mm -hmm. or memoir cum cultural criticism. Mm -hmm. So I want to push in other directions rather than go back. You know, essays, shorter. Essays, sure. We'll see who strikes my fancy. Um, so uh, this other direction, that just takes me exactly where I want to go. So your <laughs> second book, uh, The Memoir Negro Land, is published in 2015. First, um, why'd you choose that title, What Was Negro Land? What, All right. What that? Well, Negro Land was the term I coined for that old world as I saw it, which was for my purposes, uh, the world of post pre World War II, meaning my parents' generation, mm -hmm. um, really early 20th century, and post World War II, uh, covering for me uh, the 50s, 60s, into the 70s. And I picked the word Negro because until the late 60s, when black um, came in, Negro capitalized was the the word of choice, it was the ruling word, and it summed up and it, you know, it represented, you know, every, every, every mode of expression, you know, from serious historical scholarship to journalism. Um, and I wanted to retain names have always been so historically resonant for, for black people and mm -hmm. so culturally charged. But we have over the, just over the course of the 19th and 20th century, we have debated fiercely, you know, because we were always being debated about fiercely and always being abused by nomenclature. So did we prefer to be called Afro-Americans, which actually showed up, or Afric-Americans in, I think, the 19th century. Then there were colored people, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, then Negroes, the fight to get the capital in. Um, Afro-Americans had a brief flurry of popularity along with black, then African Americans. Yeah. Names are always with any group whose social and political status is debated, fought over. De uh, names are always very, very, very charged. So I wanted that name to represent an entire historical period. And I paired it with land because, partly because um, it was a very particular world I grew up in, partly the geographical um, separations and, and segregations between black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. So there was that. Um, a land is a homeland. Um, a land can be this very perilous region, you know, stuck between cultures. Um, 
we were poised as bourgeois blacks in many ways between um, masses of white people and um, other classes of black people. So that was a kind of land. And of course, a land can be um, an interior space, too. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping all of those things would signify. Mm, that's wonderful. Well, the book certainly shares many memories of your coming of age in, in the mid-century Negro elite. But the book does many other things as well. And to, even to call it a memoir, it seems to me, is insufficient. How do you understand the form of that book? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it does so many things. And it uses so many different strategies to do those things. That was, um, that really mattered to me just as a writer. I wanted to try to do things that I just hadn't done um, mm -hmm. as a critic. You know, things like dialogue and scene, you know, and confession. You know, um, you, you know your, your mode of confession when you're a critic is very <laughs> elegantly constrained, you know. Um, so I wanted to do all of those things. Also, I realized I struggled um, until I realized it. But I suddenly realized, you know, you can't just suddenly remake yourself mm -hmm. as a memoirist. You have been, whatever that means, um, you have been a critic for years. You have to bring that sensibility to this memoir and, and use it. And that's actually when I first came upon that opening that says, mm -hmm. you know, I was taught, you know, not, you know, not to confess, not to reveal. And what does that have to do with being a critic and being a black and whatever? And that, that realization and the wanting to just use different styles, forms, mm -hmm. modes, mm -hmm. um, those two things. And the fact that I tend to write by um, magpie mm -hmm. collection, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I do a scene one day. I, you know, I, I do a huge piece of historical research the next week. Um, but that led me to realize that I had to find a structure that was more of a of a composite, mm -hmm. more of a, you know, collage, collage, if you will. Yeah, it is a sure, and it felt much more comfortable once I. And it's just it. a wonderful piece of writing. I mean, it's such a great piece of writing. Thank you. One of the many striking aspects of Negroland is your account of the responsibilities and the burdens of privilege in Negroland. Can you say a little bit more about why those responsibilities were so important and why they were burdensome? Sure. Um, we were taught, and our, as our parents and grandparents and you know had been taught, that you were constantly, you as a people, were constantly being scrutinized, judged, um, belittled, passed off, and that your behavior, all your accomplishments had to repudiate um, the will towards those judgments, and it had to rise above the results of those kinds of judgments and, um, and wrongs, if you will. You always had to. So you were, you were a symbol from the very beginning, and everything you did um, from the way you spoke to, you know, the way you walked um, in the most ordinary circumstance could have huge consequences. You know, anything you did could be um, a, a bad mark against your people. Uh, now, we were also taught that, that's the old W.E.B. Du Bois, the talented 10th ESOS. We were also taught that um, we were supposed to uh, both by um, deeds that were politically and sociologically virtuous, but also by our own achievements, mm -hmm. we were supposed to help the race advance. Um, you know that old, um, it's the, combine the W.E.B. Du Bois, the, you know, every race, every people is basically advanced by, you know, its elite, which he later retracted when he, when he became a Marxist. Combine that with Matthew Arnold's uh, The Best That Has Been Known and Thought in the World, we were supposed to be representatives of both, <laughs> both those, those dogmas, if you will, mm -hmm. or ideals. Mm -hmm. And you, that's formidable. And you have this added uh, pressure, which is, I mean, you, t you talk about being a third people. That is we to say, saw ourselves in many yeah. ways as a kind of third, third people. That's right. Um, obviously you know, very apart from um, the masses of um, Caucasians, and not as apart, but nevertheless 
um, very separate culturally in many ways. Not wholly, but let's say in terms of, in terms of privilege and advantages and certain ambitions um, f separate from the, the masses of Negroes, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. black people, yeah. So, you know, that was a somewhat self-congratulatory view of ourselves as the, the third um, race. So I'm being, a little, I'm being ironic when mm -hmm. I say that, but it was, it was accurate. Mm -hmm. In fact, that, that line came from a very dear friend who, whom I, yeah, I grew up with, and she said this to me one day while I was writing the book. And I said, oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take that and work with it. <laughs> so um, related uh, point that you write quite eloquently about is the difference between privilege and entitlement. Explain that distinction as you understand it. At that point in the book, I'm talking, I think, about black privilege versus the kind of entitlement that all kinds of white people, who may in fact have very little actual social um, or educational or cultural privilege, have by virtue of being able to consider themselves um, white. Um, entitlement is um, a kind of birthright. Mm -hmm. It's there it is, somewhere between being bestowed on you the way fairies showed up at Aurora's wedding and being literally in your blood. Um, but it, you know, no, whatever you do, you can at the very end resort to that and you can assert it in any minute. Privilege is, privilege can be granted, privilege can be, it should be a right, but privilege can be desegregated mm -hmm. housing facilities or um, restaurants. Uh, you know, privilege can be granted by a certain social body, taken away. It can be withheld psychologically as well as practically. Um, it can suddenly be, you know, offered again. I think actually we saw a lot of that operating in all of the press coverage and all the, around Meghan Markle's wedding. Mm -hmm. She had the privilege of being engaged to royalty, um, but she was being stripped. You know, there was no entitlement being granted her yet. She mm -hmm. was supposed to be very grateful um, and to behave very well in the face of all that privilege. So you've, you've, you've mentioned Meghan Markle, and since you've brought her up, you wrote I about did, exactly. Her. So she's still um, in, it's all, the spectacle is all still in my head. In The Guardian, and it's, it's a wonderful piece in The Guardian, and I highly recommend people read it. But say a little bit more about the argument to that piece, because it's a very interesting argument that you make about her. And because the way you've just described it is that, um, you know, she's been led into this exclusive um, family. As they, as, as they, and as much of the world saw it, yes. But... You also make an argument about her impact on that family. Yeah. Say a little bit yeah. about that. Um, I said, um, you know, without pretending that this is all going to suddenly change, <laughs> change the fate of the monarchy, the fact is, um, as I put it, um, Prince Harry um, was marrying up by marrying out. He was marrying into um, this large, fair, you know, world of um, achievers, celebrities, um, you know, extremely varied um, and interesting uh, figures, you know, from the Obamas to, yes, he had met them before, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, to sports star, to Serena Williams, mm -hmm. to, to Hollywood, which, which Apparently, aristocrats always, always love. But you know, he. But he's gaining access to all kinds of cultural, social, even political um, stimulus that he would be hard pressed to find otherwise. Otherwise, or he'd have to really work terribly hard, which it didn't seem he was terribly doing till he met Meghan Markle. Uh, you know, aristocracies of all sorts are being made up and extended and revised these days constantly. Um, you know, it's like, as you say, there's this explosion of black talent, of Latin talent, of Asian talent, um, different kinds of white talents emerging. And, you know, he's, he's gaining access by marriage. And it's interesting in terms of gender also, because mm -hmm. I'm talking about what he's gaining mm -hmm. by marriage. Mm -hmm. And normally what we think about is what the woman 
is gaining mm -hmm. by marriage. I think in this case you could argue that she's not gaining much. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're being harsh. I know, I you're know, being I know. harsh. <laughs> um, as long as she has, as long as she thinks she is and has the resources to take care of herself very well, if it turns out she isn't, mm -hmm. then I wish her very well. Well, you make a very good case in the in the piece about how. Um, how strong of a person she is and how um, developed and complex her politics are. I mean, you, you quote a number of passages where One, she's been asked specific kinds of questions and she just... And, yeah, <laughs> and that's right, she's, she steps forth. So, yeah. you know, me too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whatever circumstance <laughs> I'm in, me too, I will move past, yes. Uh, I will uh, not be a victim, yeah. So, um, since you raised the gender question, let me take you to another aspect sure. of Negro Land. One of the many things that's really fascinating about that book is how much it shows that the ideals of black respectability impacted the way women in Negro Land, especially young women, thought about and treated their bodies and appearance. And you you have incredible passages about clothing and hair yes, and, and yes. say a little bit about that part of the story. Well. Yeah, the black body, a phrase we so often use, is it's so contested, it's so watched, it's so, it arouses so many strong feelings, it always has historically. So much of the, the body of, of sacred racist texts, you know, involve these obsessions mm -hmm. with the black body. It is talked about particularly because of, you know, the politics of lynching and mm -hmm. police brutality and prison reform. Uh, it's particularly talked about in terms of women. Men, forgive me, um, <laughs> I jumped ahead of myself. What I'm talking about in this very particular way, and it does extend beyond the bourgeoisie, are the black bodies of black women and you know, the ways in which they pose um, a challenge, a threat, um, you know, um, disorder to notions of what feminine propriety and beauty and desirability should be. Now, the 50s were, what decade before that wasn't, but you know, the 50s, they were particularly conventional mm -hmm. um, decade. And you know, they were very strict about um, you know, what any kind of female body should be. I mean, <laughs> to the number of white women, it turns out, who also straighten their hair that I have discovered right. over the years is, a, is amazing. Um, you know, so, so all women, I think, and particularly any, any kind of ethnic woman, meaning non-Anglo-Saxon, was constantly scrutinizing the size of her mouth, you know, the size of the width of her nose. Was she blonde? Was she brunette? Um, you wanted, you know, breasts of a certain size, but not too vulgarly large, uh, you know. But multiply that so, so many times for black women because, again, that, that, that insistence that as a people you are somehow physically alien. Mm -hmm. It's not just the color of the skin, you know, it's, it's these debates about, you know, do blacks have the body um, to do ballet, you know? Um, oh, they're awfully good um, sprinters, but I'm not sure. Now, these are all debates, they can be long distance runners. I mean, mm -hmm. this was constant, continual, um, obsessive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, it, um, it mapped. I mean, that's what female life so often does. The clothes, the looks, the, it maps out, you know, with this kind of meticulous, obsessive detail, the proper routes for you to take. So you, you're most often characterized as a cultural critic, and you've spoken of yourself that way today. Um, why is cultural criticism an important thing to do? Why, why, why is that a good thing? I mean, I'm an English prof, so I, I do that too. So yeah, why, why, is it, why do we do those things? Why are they good to do? Well, you know, in the, in the simplest way, um, it's, it's finding the sources of, of aesthetic and intellectual pleasure and helping spread that around, you know, um, giving people. Um, tools to think and feel, and also giving them the material, you know, to, to savor these, these, these experiences. Uh, but I also think, 
it's important because, um, first of all, it helps, cultural criticism helps us track the relations between um, the so-called very serious parts of our lives, um, which I, in which I include our serious education, um, mm -hmm. but also our, our politics, our, you know, our ethics, etc., and these everyday passions that we have, the, the TV shows we love, the books we read, and not just the great books, you know, um, or, the, or the sanctified movies, you know, the junk. The debatable stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's 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 like the material of psychoanalysis. You know, <laughs> no detail <laughs> is too small. But education has so often, for decades and for centuries, um, often been a been a matter of kind of getting rid of the dross, mm -hmm. you know, and preserving this perfectly developed, refined um, person whose tastes um, are. Like, like a wonderful museum um, uh, gallery. And I think what cultural criticism can do is, is shake that up, give us, give us room to, to bring all that other material, be it ephemeral, be it low-line or low-life, um, you know, into the same gallery. Put these things side by side and um, think about them and recalibrate their relations to each other. Hmm, wonderful. We have about a minute left. My last question. Yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> it does. Um, you're also a teacher of writing. Yeah. Say a little bit about how you approach that pro project. It's a strange business because a teacher of writing is, um, you are partly an editor. So you, you know, you want not to be. Um, there's a strange balance between kind of holding forth and trying to pass on a sense of what you know and mm -hmm. care about with entering, you know, the way an actor might enter a character, um, the work that the student is trying to do and, you know, trying to help them and read it and, and help shape it from their point of view. Well, on that note, let me thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. For me, too. I've been speaking with Pulitzer Prize winning cultural critic and writer Margot Jefferson. She is the author of On Michael Jackson and the memoir Negro Land, which won the 2015 National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography. Jefferson gave lectures titled From I to We, The Role of the Citizen Critic at the University of Oregon in Eugene and in Portland on May 30th and 31st, 2018 as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2017-18 Criticos Lecturer in the Humanities. The lectures were part of the We the People series. Thanks so much for watching. Mm -hmm.